Well, hello, everybody. This is Dave Berkus for the Berkus Report for Ion Business. We've been covering during these last sessions a board of directors, something that some of you may not need or know that you may not need, but some of you will have a chance to take advantage of help from others who might advance your business quickly. So today we're going to talk about boards again. This will come from my books, Perconomics, available at Amazon and many other suppliers as well. And these are things which I think all of us need to know something about, even if we don't have a board. So let's talk, if we can, about extending the runway. That'll be the general title we'll talk about. But today, we're going to speak about how to pay an early stage board. You may have a very small business, and your business may be one where you can't afford to pay cash. And so that is the first thing to say. Cash is nice, but I've been on over 40 boards, and only on one of them have I been paid cash. So we expect something else instead, and the something else we expect are stock grants or stock options. But stock grants create a taxable event for your board members and typically are something you don't want to make so that they would have to pay tax early on. So stock options are the way in which we'd like to do that. A stock option is a promise to give stock anytime someone pays for it at the price the stock is set, and it'll be earned over a period of two to four years. What that means is, if somebody leaves you after one year, they would earn one quarter of the stock option that you had granted them. If they leave after three or four months, typically we call that a cliff, they earn nothing at all. But if they stay four years or more, they have earned all the stock and they can exercise their option, which means pay the stated price, accept the shares, and be ready at some point to sell those shares when the company is sold, or sell them back to the company, depending on the arrangement that you make. And so, we're looking at the type of compensation for a typical board. How much time does a board member spend in return for that compensation of stock or stock options? Well, typically it is one board meeting a month for early stage companies and maybe a phone call during the month from you or from a senior executive asking a question where the board can help. These are things that I think are important for you to know that you have this resource in your board members in helping to guide a company. And if you remember from previous conversations that we've had, you are aligned with the board because both of you gain when the company makes money and is sold. And it is something then that allows the board member to participate in that sale as well. Here's a little side note. If you have a board chairman who is an outside person and spends more time with you than the other board members, ordinarily you would add another half a percent, making a total of a 1% plus a half a percent to that chairman, or 1% of the company in a promise to each board member. Okay, so consulting fees are okay if a board member spends a lot of time with you. For instance, somebody helping you in sales. But other than that, the board members don't expect to be paid in any way at all. So that's how to pay an early stage of board. But let's talk about what could happen if you don't want a board or if you're so early stage that you don't need a board. By the way, in the state of California where we are today, the requirement of the state is that there be one board member for every shareholder up to a maximum of three required board members. So if you happen to have two shareholders, even if it's you and your spouse, you need two board members. But if you have outside investors, you need to have three board members as the legal maximum, but most companies then go up to five. But that's something you need to know, but you could instead have a board of advisors. So let's talk for a few seconds about that board of advisors. You can fill out areas of the company's expertise that you couldn't have afford, uh, afforded otherwise, such as sales talent or marketing talent or just executive help, and fill it out with members of the outside called advisors. And an advisory board can have people who have a well-known name in your industry, for example. It's a very good thing to have on the list, on a letterhead, on slides, or better yet, in your website, names of people who are agreeing to be on an advisory board for you and you call upon them on occasion, as you'll see. It creates a list of known names. It allows for a complimentary way for you to move persons off the corporate board if you're in a later stage and you have further investors and not enough room for them on the board. So it gets back to that question again. How do you pay an advisory board? Well, again, it's stock options, just like it was on the board of directors, only it's much less because there is no legal requirement that a board member have any fiduciary responsibility if you're on advisory boards. So it's about a quarter of 1% instead of the 1% that a board member is paid, and a quarter of 1% usually vested over two years, sometimes as long as four years. Vesting means, again, that if your advisor leaves or does not provide services after a half a year, there is a very small amount earned. And by the way, 
Earned only means able to buy. It means that the advisor will still have to exercise or purchase the stock at the agreed upon price. So that's how an advisor is paid. And then we have to ask about what it is for an advisor to do. An advisor typically gives a half a day a year in a strategic planning session with you and with your senior members, and then is available by phone calls somewhere between one and two times a month. And that's the way an advisor gets paid a quarter of 1% of the company. Then you have to worry finally about legal protection issues of those people who now are coming alongside and taking some of that responsibility. D&O is called Directors and Officers Insurance Policies. They typically cost about $4,000 a year, but they protect you and the board against any outside lawsuits for the governance issues that you may have in the, uh, in the operation of the company. And it does prevent the exposure of individual board members. And you can reduce exposure by doing other things as well, which we don't have time to cover in this particular time, but it is something that you'll know, and your attorney can help you, or you can find from the slide, other things that will reduce the exposures as well. So I have many, many stories of bizarre incidents where I have been sued as a board member, where I learned some of these lessons that I'm trying to teach today. But the bottom line is, you can have a board, you ought to protect the board, and the board should be able to add a lot of value to help you as you continue to build your company. These are all stories from Brookonomics. In future times, we're going to talk about the things you can expect from a board more specifically than we have had time for today. Well, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report on Ion Business. My name is Janice Varney Hamlin. I'm Executive Vice President for Varney Consulting, member of TCA, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Lauren Ellemeyer. I'm the president, odd days, of Beyond 15 Communications, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Welcome, viewers. Uh, I have with me Janice Varney. Uh, Janice is an entrepreneur, uh, co founder of Varney Consulting, and a colleague of mine on Tech Coast Angels in the Orange County area. Welcome, Janice. How are you? I'm doing great. And, David, thank you for having me today. Always a pleasure. So, one of the things that you have done at TCA is being a deal lead. So I wanted to talk about what it really takes to be a deal lead, but before that, I'm really curious to know how do you select a company that you're investing in? That, actually, that's an excellent question and a good place to start. Um, when I first got into this world, they were, um, I wasn't really quite sure where to start, and I said, well, it makes a lot of sense for me to invest in things that I know about. So I looked for projects that I actually knew something about. So these were things like consumer products, uh, entertainment, <laughs> things around the world of women. Those things I know about. All right. So, so this is going to be a loaded question, and you really <laughs> gave me a softball. Now, Victor Kayam liked Remington so much, he bought the company. Mm -hmm. Now, you're a deal lead for a company called Love Lab? Yes. Now, did you use their product? And if so, how? And are you trying to get a date? Or what's Love Lab about? Well, Love Lab is designed to actually verify love online. I think anybody who's used any kind of online services is aware that sometimes when you go out for a date, the person that you think is going to show up for that date may not be the same person. And they may not look the same. They may not exactly be what their profile said they were going to be. Is so this it, from personal experience? It is from personal experience. I'm I have to curious. say, it is from personal experience. My way of verifying the date when I first got into the dating market after 25 years of marriage was to actually 
take a picture of my date in a very nondescript manner, get his phone number, which I would get ahead of time, so I make sure we met up right, and I would send it to my sisters who would then look them up and make sure they didn't have a criminal record. And then I said, if I, if I I'll get, send you the 411, you know, information, yeah, yeah, yeah. if... Uh, if uh, I need any help, and you can call somebody out to save me. But I was very skeptical, skeptical about the online dating world when I first went into it. So, and when I saw Love Lab, I actually met Steve Ward at a networking event that was sponsored by Google. Uh -huh. And a friend of mine said, you've got to talk to this guy. He's uh, really a fascinating uh, person, and he had his own... Um, television show at one time that ran for seven season, right. which was a relationship show. But what he was was persistent. So besides looking at uh, topics or companies that I know something about and are interested in, I also look at the CEO. Right. It does that person has what it takes to build a great entity and take the ball over the finish line. Fundraising and starting up a company, they, it's not for wimps. Well, let me ask you a question about um, the, the due diligence. You go through due diligence, you mention the CEO, and we know that that's important. Well, probably the most critical thing today in looking at an investable company. But what happens, how do you evaluate Steve, or how did you evaluate Steve? How do you evaluate the rest of his team? Um, I did a couple of things. One is uh, I was relatively new in the game and doing any kind of due diligence or leading it. So mm -hmm. I built a team that I thought would be filled with people who had an expertise which needed to be done on due diligence. So right. I had somebody on technology, somebody who was an accountant, someone from on a finance team, someone on a um, like for an entertainment format that could look at social media and what he was doing on the marketing right. team. Did all of that. And I even, in this particular case, called every single member of his advisory board and his board, including in this case, his mother. So I interviewed them all, and then I wrote everything up on that and had each of the team members prepare the report, rolled it up into one document, yeah. and sent it out to the in investors. And now, you have a very, you have a waiting question for me, a no, burning I'm just, question. I'm just thinking, <laughs> I, I know Steve, and you know, I'm, I have this picture of his mother as Yent of the Matchmaker. Yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. And pretty Steve's close. like the male version of yeah, Yent of yeah, the Matchmaker. Yeah, very funny. So um, now you, let's go back to the technical side. Now you look at the business itself. What were some of the questions you wanted to ask Steve about the business itself? How did you evaluate the business? How did you break it down and how did you divide the work up among your team members? Well, I looked at the business itself to see if how scalable it was, mm -hmm. what the competitive environment was. And when looking at that, the way that he had designed his product and his offering uh, is, was going to be very difficult to have it be successful because the original positioning of that company would have put him in direct competition with companies like eHarmony, uh, right. Match.com, right, right. Tinder, and he did not have the resources to battle that. So he was willing to make a pivot. And that pivot repositioned his company as sort of like the Carfax right. of online dating. And, and I it was like a, that. It, it made perfect sense. But that meant his, the technology had to change. So with the, and that meant the deal terms had to change. So we were able to pull in some technology inven, uh, investors, mm -hmm. one of which did the due diligence on the technology portion of the investment and ended up being one of the key investors Oh, in Love cool. Lab. Yeah, it was very cool. Very now, cool. what were some of the landmines you found? You go and you're doing due diligence, you go through it, you expect something to happen. What went bump in the night? Anything? Uh, yeah, a couple of things did. One was when uh, Steve Ward was a young man, he was quite a playboy. And, you know, once you put something out on social media, it is there forever. Yep. So I found some pretty interesting facts about that, and I put them in the report. And you're not going to show them tonight. Uh, probably not. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, this is a I do have visual, show. Yeah, I do have visual aids. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to use them tonight. I'm not touching that one at all. Um, so, like, you, you now looked at the business, you now looked at the CEO, and you made a decision, okay? Yes. Did you take a look at how he's going to expand Love Labs into some other area, or is he just going to, or is, uh, is your advice to just concentrate on matchmaking and is there anything you can share in terms of what you were able to tell Steve in terms of growth hacking how he's going to grow fast 
Yes, so that was actually a, a whole team collaboration on that, oh, you know, cool. how we were going to approach that. So, first of all, primarily we want to stick with the market that he has a wonderful reputation in, and that's in the right. area of relationships. So, Love Lab is going gonna, is gonna to focus on the dating industry and providing services to that industry, including the big players. Right. Um, it, there's been a lot of attention given to the safety of people when they go out on dates from men, not only women, but also men who are right. getting robbed on dates. So we feel that with all the pressure and the attention in that area and also uh, Steve Ward's reputation and being in the public eye and being looked at as an expert, those two things are like, it's, it's sort of like the perfect match so to speak. Um, so focusing on that is important. We have mm -hmm. limited resources. We want to build one market before we turn attention away to another one. Would, would, would there be anything you can share in terms of how he's going to get recognition? How will he gain virality? How will he gain traction in the market? Well, yes, I can share that. He has, um, he is a very known personality within um, within a certain genre of people um, and he's we've done messaging testing on Facebook um, he's also going to be touring on college campuses mm -hmm. talking about relationships and introducing college students to Love Lab there's a whole PR spin that he can bring to the table like very few people can within the relationship area Mark Cuban's blog even blogged about Love Lab because people know him you know, right. they think what he's doing is really interesting for a celebrity of Steve Ward's status within a given market to move into the world of entrepreneurship is right. quite a big step. You know, it's to be well noted that he's been so persistent with, and just worked this business with such passion. It's really nice right. to see. Yeah, and I actually like the I'm not I'm not a tremendous fan of Love Lab. But I like the name because it's catchy. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I also would, I think there's a, it's a great platform and it's ex, it, it can be expanded into looking at credibility or the character or the background in a business mode, like for small and medium businesses, relatively cheap uh, versus some others. Correct. Like you look at even... Um the real estate market. Let's say you have an apartment for rent and you want to do a quick background check on right. somebody. You can even go as far as asking them if they're willing to reveal a criminal check, which is right. not unusual when you're applying to rent an apartment or lease a home. And so you could use it for that. You could do it for leasing cars. You, right. you know, there's a numerous things, tools, and other industries that he could go into. So one last question. If you can leave the viewers with some good advice, like two or three key bubbles. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say if the viewer wants to become an investor and look at a company or wants to evaluate an, invest in, an investment itself? I'd say number one, invest in what you know. Yep, good point. Number two, invest in the CEO. Number three, make sure that that company has enough resources to get it to the finish line, to get it launched and be successful. It, Usually that means a number of investors coming in to make sure that you fill that need for cash. So it's not just services, but it's also cash to keep the company running so that you have resources in order to let it grow. So, you know, if you're asking for a million dollars and you only get 500000 you have to ask right. yourself, are they going to have enough money to make this thing happen? And then also to look at, you know, where do you want your personal portfolio to be? You know, do you want to just focus on technology? Do you want to just, do you want to have pharma in there? Do you want to have a balanced portfolio? Right. Those things are also very important. Well, there you hear it from a very classy investor, entrepreneur. Uh, Janice, thank you very much for thank appearing you. on uh, Street Savvy Business. This is David Friedman signing off for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Have a good evening. I'm Dave Burkus. They call me Mr. Trend, and you're watching Ion Business. Good evening, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. I want to take, I have the pleasure of introducing Lauren Ellemeyer. Uh, Lauren is the co-founder and president of Beyond 15. It's a boutique public relations and social media company. Welcome, Lauren. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, quite welcome. How'd you get into the PR business? You know, it was my major a long time ago. Um, and so I was a PR communications major um, out of the country. I did my bachelor's at the European University overseas in Spain, moved back to the States, um, started working up at an agency in LA, um, mainly on the entertainment side, wasn't for me, 
um, ended up working at another agency mm -hmm. in Southern California and then started my own. Well, that sounds really good. So I, you know, over the past several years, I've seen a resurrection in public relations. Mm. So, uh, and I know you do public relations and social media. How do you see these two being connected today and how is it applied to businesses today? That's a really good question, David. So the way I see them being connected is that you and I both know that the media is getting smaller and smaller as far as print goes. Um, more people read the Orange County Register online on Sunday than they do in print these days. And so social media is just another platform, a very viable platform to share your news with of a brand. All right. So a question has always puzzled me, and a lot of my friends ask me the same question, but I don't answer. <laughs> What's the difference between public relations and publicity? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, and it took me some time to kind of wrap my head around that too. When I started my career, it was on the publicity side. Um, that tends to be more entertainment based. Um, celebrities, they are paying you to get them placed in the media. Public relations, especially the type that we do at Beyond 15 Communications, is heavily focused on businesses, publicizing B2B and B2C news. Um, so there is a difference there. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that you've done, some of the campaigns sure. that integrate, well, it doesn't have to integrate, but public relations and or social media or collectively. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about a unique campaign. We're always trying to find things that are not in the norm, trying to find things on street savvy business that allow you to expand beyond a box. Mm -hmm. So w tell me about some of the programs that you put together. Yeah, well, we have one client. They're an uh, international mobility client of ours. We just handle their media relations specifically. And um, there was a time recently when gay marriage was a hot topic, and we were able to intertwine gay marriage into the national and international mobility kind of news. Um, we placed them in Wall Street Journal. Um, so we're always looking for fresh angles to get our clients placed in the media. Um, Toyo Tires is one of our accounts. We handle all of their social media. Um, we're always looking to do innovative campaigns for them. Um, a lot goes on as far as tweeting and live campaigns as well. So I have two questions that relate. Do you do the content for like Toyo mm -hmm. or do they give you content and you fine tune it? As far as Toyo goes, it's a little bit of both, but predominantly for all of our clients, we generate and curate all of their content. So the foundation of a good public relations agency really is high quality content. Got it. Okay. We've got a team of incredible writers. Uh, we write about things from lasers that treat gum disease to tires. Yeah, I want to talk about tires. Um, oh, okay. Because I just had my tires rotated, so it's kind of high on okay. my mind. I just had a flat but, tire. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the question. What is it, can you share an innovative program that you did for Toyo that people would recognize? Um, you know, personally, off the top of my head, no. I handle mostly the business development side for the agency. Uh, delegation, um, I remember that. Yeah, so I would need to have one of my colleagues here, um, Stephanie, predominantly, who handles that campaign to really be able to speak uh, about a recent cool campaign that she's done. All right, so let's let's switch it over. You mentioned a couple of times about keeping ideas fresh, mm -hmm. and you mentioned Stephanie. Mm -hmm. How do you find the right people to work in your agency? That's a really good question, and I'm still learning. So when I started the business, um, you know, I know PR like the back of my hand, but hiring was never a sweet spot of mine, and so. Um, we look for people that move quickly, that have a background in PR or journalism, so they have that foundation of writing there. Um, but the people that we work with, we're a team of 14, all women, nothing against men, um, right now happens to be... On behalf of the men, I feel slighted, <laughs> yeah. but that's... <laughs> well, <laughs> or I want to work there, actually. <laughs> yeah, come on in anytime. Um, and so it's all women, and they're all millennials. And so it's very interesting for my business partner, Leslie, and I, um, finding the right fit. And I see and I hear a lot of kind of negative about millennials these days, and I find it to be the complete opposite. Our team is highly motivated. They work. Uh, they're detail-oriented. They're eager. And they're really, they love being a part of a team. Um, but to answer your question, to go back to it, how do I find the right people? It's tough. So we utilize LinkedIn. I put up mm -hmm. ads. I bring them in. I interview them. I have the team interview them. Um, I've got a set of questions, and it's more of a feeling at this point. Do you have a great question to ask people 
like one great question in the interview process? Um, yeah, so I do ask um, if you're on a conference call and your task is only to take notes and you're going to turn these notes over to a team member and they're going to develop a press release out of it, what happens if the conversation is highly technical and you get lost? Um, and I always look for someone to just say, I keep going, I write everything down, I turn it over because I have had team members in the past that just gave up yeah, on a call, <laughs> and that is not good, because no. then you have nothing to, to share. So, one final question. If you were to provide advice to somebody looking to hire an agency mm -hmm. to provide this, what I call, shaping the market, or broad brush, mm -hmm. um, you know, overview of what they're providing, mm -hmm. not versus the, like, email marketing or an SEO campaign, but, mm -hmm. you know, just this high umbrella campaign, what would be the two or three things that you would tell people to look for either in an agency mm -hmm. or in an innovative, you know, PR, social media type program? Sure. So I'm biased. I like that boutique model because I feel like with the real mega agencies, mm -hmm. you're kind of just a number. And when you work with a boutique agency, it's their livelihood. And so I would say um, maybe look to work with a boutique agency and then talk to their references. And when I hire vendors now, I always call their references because I've worked with people in the past and it just didn't work out. And had I called or asked, I probably would never have worked with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then ask about marking up because beyond 15, we don't like to nickel and dime people because we right. don't want to be nickel and dime. So when we send out a press release or we run your social media ads, we don't mark up. We give you a cost, you approve it, and the company bills you direct. A lot of agencies, I mean, it's agency standard to tack on 15, 20 percent. Right. And I, I tend to agree with you. I don't like to be nickel and dime. I just said, give me a price. Let me, you know, get whatever it costs me, it costs me. But I don't want to argue about, you know, a percentage of media buy or spend or anything. Mm -hmm. well, listen, I really thank you, Lauren, for being my guest here. And I'm sure the yeah. viewers got a lot out of it and a couple of good ideas. And I'm sure they'll look forward to some of, seeing some of the social media and uh, PR campaigns for Toyo and some of the other companies that you've worked with. Uh, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, presentation.